Hello and welcome uh, to this week's Focus on Geothermal Energy for the Weekend webinar. My name is Alexander Richter. I'm from ThinkG Energy, and this webinar is a, in partnership with our German colleagues at Enerchange. Today, I'm very pleased to have with me uh, Todd Parker, the president and CEO of Blue Spark Energy, an energy technology company uh, specialized in high pulsed power, headquartered in Calgary, in the province of Alberta, in Canada. Previously uh, Vice President for Weatherford, uh, he has been building up a Blue Spark uh, company uh, with its technology that can be really effective in geothermal well bores, uh, using a, like a very cost effective and efficient method uh, to remove scale scaling in, in wells. Uh, with that, I think I will leave it uh, to Todd, but maybe just as a quick note, you have the possibility to ask some questions. Uh, in the in the uh, question panel of uh, your, your webinar dashboard. So please put some questions in after the presentation. Uh, we will try to get to these questions as much as we can. And hopefully Todd can, Todd can then uh, go into more detail on some of those questions. And with that, uh, the floor is yours, Todd. Over to you. Thank you very much, Alex. So I want to talk today, <clears throat> excuse me, about the technology that Blue Spark has developed. And fundamentally, it's a technology that's used for uh, wellbore remediations. In terms of wellbores, be they uh, geothermal, water wells, uh, or even hydrocarbon wells, um, have a tendency over time to accumulate debris within the wellbore that impacts the effectiveness of the flow through the wellbore. And of course, you know that's a feature of fluids moving through the wellbore, potentially through reservoirs in or out. Uh, acquiring sediment and mineral uh, and of course going through different pressure and temperature changes and, and when that fluid goes through those pressure and temperature changes it tends to leave that sediment or minerals uh, mineralization behind and as you can see in the pictures it, it can become quite severe uh, in well bores and, and this is a particular issue within the geothermal space and we'll talk about that around some of the limitations uh, of various technologies and being able to clear that material. Uh, of course, you know, let's be clear, there is no problem out there that's unsolvable. Um, today, in remediating these issues within well bores, there are various techniques. You can use acids or chemicals. You can use a, a mechanical brushing or milling, either with a lightweight or, or a heavyweight intervention, including up to and including using a rig. Uh, of course, you can simply use explosives or propellants to put new holes to reconnect with the reservoir to keep the fluids moving. And there are various seismic, ultra seismic, and, and ultimately water jetting technologies that, that can move that material away. What I want to introduce today is the concept of using electricity uh, to perform that task and talk about some of the features that, that using electricity has. First and foremost, of course, um, it, the technology works. And I'll go through some of the specific geothermal and injection well uh, results that we've had, but we've done over a thousand operations now in plus 25 countries, and, and we've had excellent results, as you can see on the left side of the screen. And, and why do people use the Blue Spark technology or high pulse power? It, it's really because it eliminates in those previous uh, the techniques on the previous slide. It eliminates a lot of the risks that may be involved uh, in deploying that into a geothermal well. First and foremost, electricity is, is easily transportable. So if you have electricity at your well site, our technology uh, simply uses that as its energy source uh, to do the work involved in cleaning the well bore. It, it does sound unusual, uh, but when our technician arrives with our equipment, uh, he literally unplugs the coffee pot and plugs our device in. And, and that's our energy that we use uh, for the wellbore remediation. So in terms of mobbing and demobbing, uh, heavy equipment, lots of personnel, perhaps chemicals, uh, we don't have any of those features. It's a very lightweight instrument, uh, plugs into, as I said, your existing infrastructure at the well site. And the only additional piece is, is the requirement for a wireline unit to uh, deploy our equipment into the well. So no handling of dangerous goods. There's no chemical uh, possibilities of chemical spills or, or handling of chemicals at the well site or transferring the, the chemicals anywhere. Uh, the tool itself is uh, has no moving parts. There's no uh, components inside the tool that are uh, risky of any nature in terms of import or export restrictions or, or handling 
you know, dangerous materials. There's no risk of that tool getting stuck in the well because there are no moving parts. It's a completely slick tool. And as you'll see in a couple slides later, it actually doesn't touch anything in the well bore. And so it makes it a very simple and safe operation. Of course, from an ESG perspective, very low environmental footprint, sustainable in terms of being able to use um, whatever energy uh, is providing your electricity at the well site. And of course, there's no delayed results. Once you unplug that material that's uh, preventing your well bore from operating at its peak efficiency, your, your well bore immediately starts operating at peak efficiency. So very low amount of time to prepare the well, to perform the operation and see almost immediate results. And of course, you know, in saying all of that, very few hidden costs. It is the cost of, of moving a lightweight equipment, minimal personnel to the well site, a rapid treatment, uh, and seeing immediate results. How does it work? Well, the technology is physically is, is very simple. Um, the principle that we use, everybody has studied this possibly in junior high school, and simply the equation power is equal to energy over time. And for us, while we create these high power events, which break up the material that are in the well board, we use a very modest energy source. Uh, ostensibly about a thousand joules of energy per pulse. And, and for those of you who, who may not know what a thousand joules looks like, uh, it's basically the same amount of energy as taking an apple and dropping it one meter onto the ground, or perhaps you know the amount of energy that's in a couple of teaspoons of, of orange juice. Very small energy source, and as I said, it, it comes from uh, you know where you plug your coffee pot in or, or wherever your energy source is uh, at the well site. Our trick is being able to accumulate that energy into uh, a storage or a capacitor, if you will, and then being able to release that energy in an extremely short period of time. And, and, and to help you picture that, I'll, I'll give you two examples. First and foremost, you think about your cell phone, uh, being able to charge up your cell phone uh, in a matter of you know less than an hour and then be able to use it for a day or two it is a low um, you know, it's a, a low power, long duration event. So you use that energy over a long period of time and you really want to keep your power usage low. And, and that's why you can use your phone for so long. We would do exactly the opposite. And in fact, if we used a cell phone to power our device, you would be able to clean, you know, some section of a well bore, uh, you know, a, a couple feet of well bore just using your cell phone alone because we use that energy in extremely short periods of time, in microseconds, in fact. So a modest energy source used in microseconds makes the P or the power in that equation quite large. And in, for some scope, um, our energy is about a thousand joules, as I said, about a couple tablespoons of, of uh, orange juice. Our power output is in the uh, two, plus 200 megawatt range. Uh, and that's because our time frame is in, in, the, in the microseconds. The other advantage, uh, other image I'll leave you with in terms of picturing what high pulse power looks like and maybe this is a you know a more common one for people to picture it's it's picture blowing up a balloon you take a balloon you slowly blow air it's a low energy event um, takes some time it's quite easy to do uh, and at the end of that you have a balloon full of air that's your stored energy and if you pop that balloon it'll make a large sound that's uh, basically a high pulse power event happening in your hand the accumulated energy over time is being released in one powerful short duration event. And, and that's exactly what we're doing. We're creating a very high power event, short duration in the well board itself. Uh, that, that event, as I said, is plus 200 megawatts in intensity. For all in practical purposes, that's a 10,000 PSI uh, hydraulic pulse or shock wave. And that's what we use uh, to treat the, the well board to remove any kind of scales, mud cakes, or fines. We repeat this pulse about every five seconds. And so we have the ability um, to move the tool up and down the well bore and pulse up to 12,000 times per run in the well. And that translates to typically in uh, you know, a barium sulfate or very hard scale uh, section of the well bore that's, that's uh, where it has accumulated, that's a couple to 300 meters of interval to be able to be treated in a single run uh, with wireline. A lot of people are wondering how that pulse actually interacts with the materials down in, in the well. And, and basically, here's a, a very simple schematic of the tool. It's in the center of the well bore. Uh, as I said, we accumulate electricity within the tool in a section of capacitors. Our secret sauce is the ability to release that electricity in a very short period of time. 
And it creates, from a point source, in effect, uh, a very high power shock wave. And that shock wave radiates uh, from around the tool, 360 degrees, and starts interacting through the fluid uh, with the material that it encounters. And, and we use a couple of different principles here. We're using essentially the shock wave being transmitted into the material and reflecting off different boundaries uh, with that, within that non-homogeneous scale. And every time it interacts with that boundary, it starts to reflect and there's enough power uh, and depending on the index of reflectivity, it will start causing that material to come apart. And so, you know, when I talk about a 10,000 PSI shock wave, we're not actually using that shock wave to compress or damage that material. We're actually using the resultant reflectivity of the shock wave and creating a tensile force within the material that makes it come apart. So we essentially, we're tearing the material apart and, and that's beneficial in the sense that it breaks the scale up. But in terms of where that scale is bonded to inside the wellbore, uh, in the screens, in the perforations, or further up the wellbore itself, being able to pull that scale off of the steel casing uh, and, and essentially clean that casing with that tensile or pulling force. We have no effect on the casing itself. In fact, the, the strong lattice network of, that makes up steel casing reflects plus 95% of the shock waves. And so very effective at reflecting and creating that tensile force that pulls the material away from the steel casing in itself. Because almost all of the shock wave uh, power is reflected off the casing, very little transmits through the casing and into the cement that might be supporting the casing with, within the wellbore or providing some sort of zonal isolation. Uh, less than 1% of the energy will, will travel through that uh, and have zero impact on the cement. Now, people will ask us, how, how do we know that? And it's because we have tested this several thousands of times for customers where they have sent us pieces of their wellbore completions, various types of casings, uh, various types of screens, subsurface safety valves, perforated pipe, uh, all manner of material and have us pulse in it thousands of times. And we do a number of different tests. First and foremost, and I'll show some pictures later on, uh, remove the material that they believe uh, is the impediment in their wellbore. We also show mechanically that there is no deformation or changes in the casing or the material that we're, we're uh, pulsing within. And of course, we've built up um, both on surface, surface testing to show that the uh, shock waves have no impact on the external cement. And similarly, we've run diagnostics in the wellbore itself, pre and post treatment, uh, to measure the effectiveness of the scale removal, to measure the integrity of the casing before and after the operations. And of course, being able to measure the cement integrity and the fact that we've made no change uh, to the to this, uh, cementing ability in the wellbore itself. So using uh, small amounts of electricity, as I said, trickling down uh, an industry standard wireline unit at the well site and creating plus 200, mega shock, 200 megawatt shock waves uh, thousands of times has the ability to clean uh, long sections of wellbore where this uh, scaling material has built up and is preventing uh, operation very clean, very carbon friendly, very sustainable. Question of course is, is does this work? And uh, so we've tried this, as I said, in plus a thousand operations around the world over the last number of years as we've developed the technology. And we've really come up against some difficult challenges that people have thrown against us to see if this technology matches up against either their existing uh, techniques or um, being able to restore well bores that previously they would have abandoned uh, and just drilled a new well with the thought that the well board was no longer able to function. In this particular case, uh, a customer had uh, approached us with a well bore that had uh, reduced its injectivity uh, to less than 5% of its original uh, value when it was created or when the, the well bore was constructed. And what they had done previously in this well bore and other well bores in, in their geothermal uh, facility was use a mechanical dredging technique. So that was putting a rig on location and basically re-drilling the well from the inside out, uh, attempting not to damage the casing and remove as much as the material as possible uh, that had accumulated over time. In this particular area, the geothermal facility is in uh, an environmentally sensitive area. And so the permitting process, the planning process, moving the equipment, setting up uh, and, and preparing for the uh, 
operation as well as performing the operation and then subsequently demobbing and putting the well back into production uh, is a period where they plan about 24 months. It, uh, it takes them about 24 months and, and the time for that actually it was in the plus million dollars per well treatment. And what they found in terms of dredging the silica scale or the calcium carbonate that had been built up inside these well bores is that over time the dredging uh, had minimal impact on the ability uh, to improve the injectivity of the well. And that's primarily because the dredging only fulfills a single function. It removes the material that is built up inside the steel tubing, inside the casing, and is not in fact cleaning any uh, impediments that are blocking the entry zones into the well bore or the exit zones into the well bore, in this case, it's an injection well. And, and that's just the limitation of, of a mechanical dredge. It fits within the casing and cleans that uh, on the inside. Our technology, of course, as I showed, liberates material from steel and that steel can be the casing itself, uh, but it liberates the material or starts uh, fragmenting and removing the material from the perforations or from inside the screen and actually out to the external uh, of the wellbore in a, in a small radius uh, outside the wellbore itself. So it's a very near wellbore treatment and is able to clean the inside, the entry points and to some extent a small portion into the formation uh, of any of that accumulated debris. So when the uh, customer in this case uh, elected to uh, trial our technology, essentially the entire operation took uh, approximately 10 days. That included the necessary permits to move the small footprint wireline unit onto location in a crane. Uh, very little wellbore preparation was required uh, as it's a, a non-invasive uh, and non-contact treatment. Uh, and in fact, the tool itself was only operated for four days. We did subsequent runs over various sections of the well bore. Uh, the nature of our treatment is very targeted and focused. So uh, we specifically moved to sections of the well bore that had uh, the highest degree of impediment, but also showed uh, or where they felt the zone was the most receptive to being able to uh, being restored uh, to maximize the injectivity. Um, Basically, we restored after those four days and at the end of the 10 day well treatment, we, we restored the well to within 95% of its original injectivity. Uh, the quote, of course, from the customer was, was a little bit of amazement. Uh, this would have been impossible to uh, achieve using conventional technology. And they've subsequently asked us to, and to continue working on other wells that they have. The second example, uh, very similar to the first silicon dioxide scale, um, typically another geothermal uh, area where being able to use mechanical dredging or uh, conventional technology such as chemicals was either very difficult or even prohibited uh, and they were looking for something that uh, would improve you know ultimately provide the same effectiveness in this particular case they were much interested in a much faster operation uh, what they were looking for was the ability to intervene in these wells before they become so damaged they create uh, an economic liability for the operations of the plant. Uh, and so looking to assess if this was a, a lightweight, uh, low risk intervention technique that could be used frequently to maximize the flow in the well bore. Basically same results as the last time. It's, it's unusual to say we increased the injectivity uh, by 12 times. Uh, the reality is, again, we've restored almost 95% of the functionality uh, of the well board itself. So this is a technique within you know, a matter of days as compared to conventional technologies using very small amounts of electricity, no consumables, no chemicals, no explosives, uh, nothing hazardous in any sense, being able to essentially restore the functionality of these wells uh, to like new status. It's, it's sort of the ultimate in recycling tool uh, for well bores. The last example that I'll leave you with is uh, an injection well in West Africa. And this is one where it's a screens, they have screens that they were injecting through and over time, uh, the fines in the fluid that they were trying to inject would plug these screens. And typically what they would do is acidize these wells every couple of months. So they're running an extensive and expensive uh, acidizing program and had been doing this over a period of time. So had a good baseline for how effective the acidizing would be. Uh, basically, the economics of doing that every few months to maintain the well and ultimately led to the well being closed uh, for a number of years. And, and of course, that was the well that they asked us to uh, try the technology on. 
we ran uh, our, our technology down to where we felt was the highest impact area to be cleaned, which was about 30 meters of uh, screen. And uh, in less than a day, we had completed the operation and the well was put back into production after being closed for three years. And they started monitoring the results uh, of our uh, treatment. Basically, the injection rate increased dramatically um, by about 1,200% from, from where it was when we started uh, 24 hours previously. And then they decided to try the acidizing post our uh, electrical treatment. And what they found was the addition of a uh, chemical in conjunction with our treatment uh, really had a dramatic improvement in the well. By us essentially cleaning all of the uh, screen where the chemical then could follow out and do a matrix uh, stimulation, uh, dramatically increased uh, almost 3,000% the injectivity of this well. Needless to say, you know, the economics of performing a one-day treatment to restore you know, functionality of a well bore really changes the economics of, of which wells you need to close in or, or abandon uh, because they're no longer functioning at their peak intensity. Just a quick couple of pictures. Um, these are some testing that we have done for customers. And again, people are you know, curious when they hear about using electricity, uh, especially small amounts of electricity to create high power effects. Uh, we really invite them to see a physical demonstration of the technology. We have performed it in parking lots for customers around the world. Uh, and it really is a, a demonstration that from a wall plug, we can generate sufficient power uh, in our shock waves uh, and focus them on specific pieces of wellbore equipment and, and remove the challenge. Uh, in the top left, there was a screen uh, that had been installed in um, the Far East, and effectively, they had not done a, a very good job of cleaning uh, the mud cake after drilling the well bore, and the screen immediately plugged up. You can see in the top left, uh, those little uh, perforations through the pipe, which have a small screen inside that perforation, has become plugged with a very hard mud cake. And, and once it had been installed in the well bore, they were unable to initiate any injection into the well. They had uh, removed a section of the uh, screen to identify the problem and actually sent it to us so that we could test it in our facility in Calgary. And on the right, you see the results of that testing. Basically, it's the same piece of casing. We have pulsed uh, for about 15 minutes. And what you see is we have removed that debris, which is external to the casing, but through that steel mesh that you can see. And, and actually that steel mesh you know, remains intact and almost in a like new fashion. Uh, and so subsequently, based on that surface testing, we went out and treated a number of these well installations uh, so that they could begin uh, begin producing or injecting fluids uh, with these wells that they had built but, but were unable to be used. Uh, in the top right, the iron carbonate scale deposit is a section of uh, casing that a customer had brought to our facility and convinced that this was the hardest material that they had ever seen. They had used some mechanical means to try and fix it in situ in the well bore, uh, and had tried a number of different chemicals, but the iron carbonate is a very difficult material to chemically match with a, an acid that will uh, liberate it from the casing. And, and in fact, you know, it's really hard to see, but on the bottom piece of the casing, the top left picture, the customer had taken a hammer and a chisel and hammered away to show us uh, how difficult it was to remove that scale. The picture on the right is that exactly that same piece of pipe uh, after we had pulsed for about 15 minutes. And what we showed the customer was that material was not too hard for us. And in fact, we did uh, in that 15 minutes, we were able to clean that piece of pipe, uh, not to like new status, but certainly removed the bulk of that material. And again, subsequently the customer was convinced enough to allow us to go to the well bore uh, and perform the, and continue to perform these treatments in situ. In the very bottom uh, is a little bit like a Rorschach inkblot test. It's a camera, downhole viewing camera looking into a well bore. And here they were looking for areas there where they were unable to pass equipment because scale was building up on the side of the well bore. And again, um, a scale that was very difficult to remove uh, chemically and, and also in very specific sections of the well bore. And so they customer elected to use us to treat multiple short sections in the well bore where these scale bridges would build up. 
Uh, and you can see in the camera image to the right, as you look down that wellbore, uh, we have effectively opened up that wellbore uh, for subsequent access to, to other services, either diagnostics or whatever they were doing um, to monitor the effectiveness of this well. And so again, this testing and the diagnostics and being able to show people both on surface or downhole uh, is really convincing um, that the plus 100, 200 megawatt pressure pulses repeated thousands of times is very effective at disaggregating this material that's blocking well bores uh, and, and basically in a non-contact way being able to restore them back to full functionality. So who's Blue Spark that's doing this? Um, as Alex mentioned at the very start, our headquarters is based here in Calgary, Canada. Uh, we have a UK-based sales and field services team and, and we have a, a group of tools and technicians uh, that travel the globe. We typically uh, perform operations here in North America, uh, in the North Sea, West Africa, Middle East, and uh, the Far East. We've recently been starting into the geothermal markets, uh, have done some wells uh, for customers in the Far East, and have currently have projects uh, that we're scoping in both uh, Latin America and uh, in Indonesia. The technology itself uh, is you know, the high pulse power solution is you know, proprietary to us and as far as we know we're the only people using electricity in this way to treat scale mud cake and other impediments that are blocking the well bore because of the nature of the technology the fact that it's a very small amount of energy uh, that is being used it's very economical it's safe it's sustainable and most importantly it creates no damage whatsoever to the well bore in itself in fact many times i tell customers that the very worst thing that could possibly happen by running us in the well bore is that nothing happens and, and while that's a, a not a good result it certainly is far better than a chemicals or explosives or mechanical uh, technique damaging a well bore permanently rather than trying to fix it the technology itself is has some limitations currently uh, right now, it's limited to 130 degrees Celsius. That's why we treat primarily injection wells on the geothermal side. It has a minimum ID of two and a quarter inches uh, in uh, outer diameter. And we can treat, this says 120 meters per run. Really what that depends on is the type of material in the well bore. Uh, the air barium sulfates or the iron carbonates, which are very difficult materials, we require more, more pulses per meter to liberate the material. Um, silica type materials are very easy for us to break up so we can extend that pulsing range or that uh, interval range by pulsing less per meter to effect the same results we can treat selectively within well bores so rather than having to um, treat an entire section of well even you know areas that may not have uh, as high productivity as you know would, would make economical sense we can specifically go down and target to the meter uh, which sections of well bore makes the most sense to remove the debris uh, and, and just treat that area in itself. We do need an electrical surface uh, connection to surface, so that's why we typically run off of wireline units, uh, but we have run off of e-coil units and, and tractors where the well bores are, are horizontal. In terms of you know the benefits i'll summarize for one last time it's a very safe and easy to operate as i said no chemicals no explosives no controlled items whatsoever we physically dhl the components uh here from calgary to wherever the project is our person rolls up with a suitcase uh, and we pair up with the wireline uh, provider that you use for your well bores uh, and we can immediately go to work removing the material that's that's blocking the performance of the well bore no surface risk with the technology and it's at, at all it creates no surface on, uh, no pressure on surface there's no chemicals no explosives and so the safe handling at the rig site uh, requires no particular attention um, other than you know standard good wireline practice in terms of, uh, of, of moving simple equipment once again and i'll highlight we cannot damage any of the completion parts in the well bore the pressure pulses of, are of sh such short duration and such low energy intensity and as i mentioned the reflectivity of the steel casing really makes it impervious to any of the effects of the technology in itself so this is not a technology that will damage well bore components uh, it simply uses the reflectivity of the casing to peel the materials that have accumulated on uh, and break it up uh, and fall back into the well bore. 
of course, the people that we provide are well trained on this technology, and uh, we have used and, and partnered with other third party providers in various sections of the globe and trained and monitor those uh, people to be able to deploy the technology themselves uh, into the well bores. We have, as I mentioned, over a thousand operations under our belt, and our effective operating time uh, once the rig or once the well bore has been turned over to us is in the plus 97%. This is a technology that's reliable, it's simple, it's effective, um, and, and is an excellent alternative to any of the other conventional techniques that you may have used or considered uh, in cleaning well bores. Of course, that's not just me saying it. We've been recognized uh, in a number of forums for introducing this innovative technology into the industry. Most recently, uh, last year, we won the uh, Colorado uh, Oil and Gas Clean Tech Challenge. So. As oil and gas is moving to become part of a more sustainable future, uh, they are recognizing some of the innovations that, that companies like us are bringing to the field around improving ESG footprints. But of course, a well bore is a well bore, whether it's petrochemical, geothermal, or water. Uh, we have worked in all of those, and we're really agnostic in terms of the types of well bores and even the types of debris building up in the well bore. Our pressure pulses are sufficient to overcome any material that we have uh, encountered so far. Uh, and so, you know, our treatment rates in, in cleaning water wells and geothermal wells and hydrocarbon wells are, are really quite, uh, quite promising. So one final slide. Uh, we really believe that this is a, a single solution for multiple challenge inside uh, you know, in the evolving energy transition, but but even if we move that down to a micro level, we can solve uh, many uh, debris issues within a well board uh, from top to, bo to bottom, to the injection or producing interval, uh, all the way up through the well board. And even if that material changes from what's what's accumulated at the bottom versus what's moved up as the temperature changes, the pressure changes, and the mineralization or sedimentation of the, of the debris changes up the well board, this technology, as I mentioned before, is agnostic to it. We can clean whatever that material is as it changes throughout the well bore with a very targeted uh, and very specific treatment. That's all I have, Alex. Wow, super, super, super interesting. I mean, of course, I'm not that much into the technology, so to, to listen to this is really, really quite exciting. Um, there are tons of questions here, but uh, maybe I start with, let's say, some more, some more practical, practical questions, and, and then block and uh, group some of the questions because they're quite similar. To understand basically the business model that, that you have essentially is, is you have the technology and you're providing that service use, using that technology to, to basically help here in the scale removal. Is that correct? That is correct. So we provide uh, the tool in itself, and of course we provide a technician that operates that tool at the well site. Um, what we rely on in the various countries is a third party, uh, a wireline provider, and in many cases, many of these plants have their own wireline company under contract. Um, our technology is built so that we can match up with 99% of those existing providers that are that happen around or that are around the world. So we're not reinventing the wheel. We bring our unique component and knowledge to the well site, uh, and, and that's what we offer as a service. And do you, would, would you be then the one practically to, to, to engage with the wireline provider, or would this be then the customer's uh, responsibility? So I think, Alex, that really depends on, on the customer itself. Uh, in many cases, you know, because we have built the technology so that is compatible with most wireline uh, units, the customer has a wireline contractor or someone who they use regularly, and it's simply a matter of introduction to us, and we do, you know, a small integration test just to confirm applicability, and, and then we're off and running. In some cases where people don't have a wireline uh, provider in mind, uh, we we come from that world, so we have an extensive network around the globe and are able to make recommendations and introductions as necessary. So it, it really is, you know, what is required for that that particular customer, we, we are more than happy to cooperate. And from a practical perspective, like from the transportation limitations here, could the equipment be, be air freighted or helicoptered to the site? Yes, yeah, so we've actually gone to remote uh, sites and, and in fact, 
you know, that's one of our, our key benefits that some of our repeat customers use is the fact that it is highly transportable, can be heliportable, uh, and very easily moved to remote or uh, difficult to access locations. Okay, perfect. And again, then I, then just I... to be clear, in, in terms of using it at those remote locations, all you need is electricity. Okay, and then that that could be provided by a diesel generator, for example, on site. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. All right. Let let me then just kind of like refrain from further of my kind of non-qualified <laughs> questions and go to some of the the questions here from the audience. Um, and I'm just going through try to uh, group this, but here the question basically, if there's any risk of fracturing the well with the technology or is it so focused and small in that in that fraction that there's no risk here? Yeah, so that, that, that's a great question. And, and it's one, of course, that people have top of mind when they start hearing us talk about 200 megawatt events. I think, you know, first and foremost, I would offer you the empirical evidence and that we have done lots of these with lots of um, measurement and uh, integration checks, and we've never had that case happen. Uh, I think I would back away from that and also say from a very uh, physics-oriented level, if you recall, the amount of energy that we're using per pulse is, is approximately a thousand joules, and the conservation of energy uh, still applies. This is, this is still physics. So every time we pulse inside that casing, we're, we're, it's like dropping an apple on it from uh, from a meter. That's that's the effective energy utilization. Um, and so, you know, energy conservation of energy applies. We do not use enough energy to move, shape, or damage uh, any of the metal within the well construction at all. Yeah. Okay. So, so, so physically, basically, is is you have this so, so such localized kind of like uh, impulses that it basically stops at the well bore base as the well the well itself. Yeah. Okay. Got that's it. Okay. Perfect. Right. That's right. Uh, then here a question that a few people have with regards to the debris uh, in the uh, what happens to the debris and it fall, does it fall through and then is basically washed out with the with the with or washed down then into the or how how does it how does that work? So I think there's a couple of different pieces and it really um, depends on the well construction in itself. In some cases, so, you know, ultimately we are going to fragment and liberate that debris. So it has to go somewhere. It, it will become small particles. Uh, in some cases, you know, the operators allow that material to fall to the bottom of the well, uh, you know, and, and leave it there because they have lots of, of sump in the well to be able to accommodate that. In many cases, what we recommend after one of our treatments is that they, um, eat, essentially clean the well or reverse flow the well to move that material back to surface uh, and then you know they then for sure it is removed from the well bore uh, and no longer a, a, an impediment you're just not going to push it back into place after we've we've done the cleaning okay uh, okay here a question with regards to the if, if the application could also be used to eliminate salt scale in lithium mining water wells yes. So uh, we actually have been approached by some lithium uh, wells. Uh, the issue there for us is the suction strainers that they have in place. Will it physically accommodate the size of the tool? Uh, and in some cases, it is a plastic uh, suction strainer that we'd be cleaning. And, and some of our surface testing has shown that that may be difficult. But if there are steel or casing completions in those wells, then then absolutely it's a solution. Uh, here's a question on the temperature uh, with regards to, I mean, you, you said that 130 degrees would be maximum as a reinjection, and 130 reinjection is already quite high. Uh, but any plans that, that that you could bring it up to, let's say, 200 degrees C? Uh, so we currently have a couple development paths on that. So first and foremost, we are looking to, uh, we have some current projects to improve the technical the temperature limitations of the hardware in the uh, tool in itself. But we also have a secondary project where uh, using existing off the market shelf technology to encapsulate the tool, because it's a two inch tool and many of the wells that we're cleaning are seven or nine inches in diameter, the ability to use a cooling encapsulation device to, to operate in higher temperatures, uh, we have that project in place as well. So we're, we're certainly hoping within a short time frame to be able to, to get to that 200 degrees Celsius. We do realize that that is 
that is a market requirement that, that we need to push for. Uh, well, what could you do with 200 degrees instead of re-injecting? Okay, but... Uh, uh, <laughs> Gotta start somewhere, Alex. <laughs> uh, so then the question here with regards to uh, by applying higher energy, uh, could the technique also apply to remove cement LCM material from uh, behind the casing or even fractures in valve walls or formations? So, I mean, that's a great question and, and, and can lead to a lot of different conversations. The technology as it's built today um, does do some near wellbore cleaning. So through the perforations or through the screen, it will interact uh, with the formation, but within the first, let's say, 30 centimeters around the wellbore itself, as long as it has direct access. In terms of increasing the power or the energy of the service, um, there is a view that it could move further into, uh, you know, the existing perforations or where you have uh, wellbore access and effectively liberate material there. In terms of fracturing, one of the challenges with the technology is that it's, it's very short duration. So, um, you know, it's like hitting a piece of glass with your hammer. Uh, it will create a thousand cracks, uh, but those cracks may not propagate very far. And so from a fracturing perspective, we don't feel that it has a lot of applicability in, 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 in hydraulic or competing against hydraulic fracturing. And so we haven't really explored much of that. And, and the final piece of that question behind casing, regardless of the power, uh, casing is such an excellent reflector of the shock waves. Very little uh, will penetrate and, and affect that cement behind. So uh, very unlikely that this would be a great tool for that application. Yeah, that also reflects to the fracturing what we talked earlier. Um, yeah. All right. Uh, then uh, we talked about the maximum temperatures. Um, the question here on the on the downhole results in real time: Do you have a, a way of monitoring this, or how do you? When do you know that you can move on? Or, I mean, in that context, is also the question with regards to let's say you get let's say in the well, you get from the customer to say like you know in let's say in that in that section of let's say 20 meters you would scale removed i mean do you then move continuously down uh, at a certain speed or do you do this one by one and then can monitor it in that process so we do a couple of different things when we so I, I think when we are unclear of you know the size of the challenge or where the particular challenge is in many cases, we'll run a diagnostic device uh, with our tool, so it's usually a caliper, and we're able to, you know, run that caliper, identify where the obstructions or where the scale is building up, uh, and then being able to turn the caliper off and uh, run our tool, and, and then being able to turn the caliper back on and, and, and start measuring to see if the tool has uh, cleaned what, what we had planned. Um, so while not getting you know simultaneous measurement while cleaning, uh, there are diagnostics that are capable of showing, uh, confirming that you know we are treating the area that we had said that we would treat, and, and the treatment has been effective. Um, here's a question, and it's asking for a picture of how scale deposit looks like after the treatment, but maybe turning this around and uh, describing how small is the debris that 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 you create and could that be a potential problem then within the well going down let's say the bigger parts breaking out or how how, how can you picture that yeah that's a, that's a good question um you know our experience and what we have seen after a treatment and flowing the material back to surface it, it is you know while i won't say it's constituent particle size it's very small pieces uh, we pulse uh, with such a pulse density, and as I said, we break things apart at their interstitial boundaries. Um, it is you know, very, very small particulates that, that are quite easily uh, able to flow back to surface. So don't think you know, we're breaking this in, in you know, five or 10 centimeter pieces. We're, we're in the millimeters range in terms of, of what these particles look like. Okay. Uh... Okay, that I I don't know, but like, have you ever tested your technology and and GRE lined geothermal wells? I don't know. Uh, what that uh, is. So we, I'm not I'm not sure exactly what the question is there. We have done this in in reinjection wells on the geothermal side. Um, yeah. I'm not sure okay. if that addresses the question. 
yeah, I, I don't know either, so that, that's fine. Um, you, you, you briefly touched upon kind of like the time that you normally run, but, but if you were to kind of, let's say, an, an average kind of time that you've applied with the, with the client, what's, what's normally the time that you're on site and running the tool? Typically, once the well is turned over to us and we introduce the tool to the well, our treatments are less than 24 hours. Okay. And maybe then also that if that's a practical question. Let's say I have a I have a well that I need to uh, to 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 work on with scale removal. Uh, what would be the the deployment time? Let's say I I would ask you today to kind of ship something. Let's say to 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 on a site in Africa and Kenya. Let's say how, how long would it take to 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 deploy a team and and I mean, apart from availability. So availability aside, it really is. Um, you know, do you have DHL or peer later able to receive the components or ship the components to where you're at? Uh, there are no, as I mentioned, any import or export complications. So it clears customs quickly. And then literally it is someone getting on a, an airplane and flying to site. So uh, typically most of our mobilizations are, you know, are limited by DHL peer later, which is, you know, three to five days anywhere around the globe. Okay. Um... Here another question. Uh, you mentioned a minimum hole diameter of two and a half inches for the tool. So curious as to whether you have different diameter tools, as I would expect the efficiency might depend on the degree shockwave spreading between the discharge source and the valve or wall. And that's an interesting question. Um, so the size of the tool doesn't really impact the nature of the pulse. And that's because the pulse uh, you know, starts with a plasma arc between an anode and cathode at the center of the tool body. So whether the tool, the two and a quarter inch tool or the three inch, two and three quarter inch tool, basically the pulse emanates from the same point, which would, let's say is well access. And, and, you know, I think the person is keying in off the fact that that shock wave will degrade in intensity by kind of a one over R squared away from that uh, point source. So, you know what, what effectively I'm saying is in a in a five inch well we would have more effectiveness uh, than than say in an 18 inch well, uh, but that's why we have chosen the power regimes that we have for the tool. We're very confident up to a nine or even an 11 inch completion that our point source is, is able to remove um, difficult scales. So the size of the tool is really about well bore access. It, it has little impact on the performance or the effectiveness of the clean. Okay, uh, next question. Uh, does it work with two-phase fluid, fluid and steam? Uh, here, the question if it actually would, would not work in steam, is that? That's actually a really good question. So, I mean, what that person is keyed in on is that we're using the hydraulic connectivity of the fluid in the wellbore to transmit the shockwave. Uh, as that fluid becomes, we would consider it gassier or uh, multi-phase that effectively dampens that shockwave or, or the propagation of that shockwave. Uh, so we, we like very much, um, you know, a non-compressible fluid for maximum effectiveness. Uh, steam, I think, would become very difficult for us to effectively transmit a shockwave that would, would do any work for us. Okay, so next questions. Have you been using the tool in, in, in fiberglass tubing? Uh, to my knowledge, we have not done any fiberglass tubing. Um, well, actually, that, well, so we have not done in situ. We have had some customers, uh, particularly on the mining side, send us uh, fiberglass or different carbon uh, type material. And we've done surface testing to confirm no damage. We have not actually done a well bore with fiberglass in place. Okay. Uh... Here a clarification on the uh, reinforced glass reinforced epoxy, which I asked earlier about the the line geothermal wells. Here the the glass reinforced oh, the epoxy in the well okay. and the line casing and kind of here because it's the, the inside of the casing is not from metal. If that yeah. impacts the so I I, I guess I, I'm going to plead. Uh, I, I honestly don't know. I, I do not. The, any physical reason why that would be a challenge, but, but what I would really encourage is reach out to us uh, and we could source a sample 
you know, all we would need is a, a one meter section of that casing and we could do, you know, surface testing very simply to see what the effects uh, and, and even model some of the different types of debris that we might be able to clean from it. So I don't have an answer to that. We've not tried it, uh, but it would be simple surface testing to confirm. Excellent. No, good, good answer. Thanks. Um, I think we're getting here pretty much to the to the to the end. There's one more question here. Uh, here about the electric shock stimulation that, that you do. I mean, with the effect basically also being mechanical. But essentially the way you describe it, there is no risk at all because it's so limited within the within the well. Is that is that the correct understanding? So, so that's correct, Alex. It's very focused within the wellborn itself. But I'll go back to once again the conservation of energy. The amount of energy that we are impacting the well completion with per pulse is less than a thousand joules. And so while it's a high power event, it's a very brief in duration. So if you you know you kind of average the pressure pulse over time. Um, you actually don't see a, a tremendous impact to the wellborn itself. And so very localized, you're absolutely correct, but, but you have to go back to the very small amount of energy per pulse. We just do not have enough energy to, to be able to move, shape, or distort uh, of metal. It's too dense or too much mass for the amount of energy that we're applying to it. Okay. Uh, okay, here yeah, then one last question. Um, can this also be used in CBM wells for, I think, I assume it's calcium CO3 scaling removal? Absolutely. Done, done many of those. Well, that was then a quick, quick, quick and uh, an easy last answer. Uh, well, Todd, I would like to thank you very, very much for taking the time, particularly given that it's, it was 7 a.m. this morning when we started the presentation. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much for, for, for this really, really insightful uh, presentation. Uh, for the audience, uh, join us again, uh, soon, soon again. And uh, we also would like to invite you uh, to the Praxis Forum Geothermie in Bayern, October 10th to 12th. Uh, you can find more information on the website of Enerchange on that. Um, and with that, my greetings to, to the province, Alva Berda, Todd. Thanks again to you and uh, very exciting and hopefully we'll We'll be able to 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 share this presentation then uh, soon on on our website and uh, and yeah. also kind of seeing you do more in geothermal. This is very exciting and uh, looking forward to report more on what you're doing. Thank you so much and have a great no, thank, weekend. Everyone. Thank you very much, Alex.